finding, we picked basically a y interval and looked at what x's, what interval your x's had to come from to land inside your y interval. So now we're going to do the same thing, but we're going to do it algebraically. <coughs> so it's time to write down the definition of a limit. So we've looked at this, we found this, but we haven't written the limit down yet. So any epsilon greater than zero, the epsilon looks just like a backwards three. And it is a Greek letter epsilon. And this weird looking D is delta. Uh, the capital delta is the one you're probably used to, which is this one. And I'll just write that with delta, with capital delta. So the one you're used to is probably capital delta. All right, any epsilon greater than zero, there exists a delta greater than zero such that such that if x is in the interval, well, we'll write it as an, we'll write it as an inequality, which is how your book is written. If x minus a is less than delta, then f of x minus l is less than epsilon. So this is the definition. There is a 100% chance this will be in our quiz this week. Yes. So I'm going to ask you a definition, and then I'm going to ask you to prove that your, what you say a limit of your function is actually f satisfies the definition. So you know how to find it. We've done that before. But I'm going to ask you to prove using this definition. So let's look at what these inequalities are really saying. So there's some a value. And what delta is, is the amount you can move left and right around a. So we can go. That far to the left, that's delta, and that's delta going to the right. So you could label the endpoints as a plus delta and the other one as a minus delta. Those are the two endpoints for the interval. So x minus a less than delta is the same thing as x coming from the interval a minus delta, a plus delta. So that's just another way to write that interval right there. And we'll look at the other inequality. It's pretty much the same thing. We're just going to change all letters around. So put a little dividing line. fx minus l less than epsilon. I'll draw this one vertically. So there's l right there. And epsilon is the amount we can go up or down. So if we label endpoints, we have L plus epsilon and L minus epsilon going down. And of course, this means that f of x is inside the interval L minus epsilon plus epsilon. So that's another way to think about that inequality as an open interval. 
And all of this matches up exactly with the idea that we had on this graph here. We have some neighborhood around A and some neighborhood around uh, L. So let's use this definition right here and prove our limit actually with the definition, not just saying, hey, look at that graph. So we used I think the 2x function Yeah, 2x at 3. Okay. So we're going to use a definition. Now when we use a definition, we start we start at the beginning any epsilon greater than zero, it's the first line we write. So take any epsilon greater than zero. So if we read this definition, what do we actually have to show? So we have to show for any epsilon, we have to show that there is some number delta that has this property. So what we're going to have to do is basically create delta and then show that it has this property. So <coughs> breaking this down further, we're going to show that, that uh, oops. we want this conclusion. So we're going to start with looking at this inequality and then seeing if we can work backwards and get back to delta. So we're going to do something a little strange. We're going to start at the end and then see if we can recover a delta that has this property. So I'm going to write a little comment area underneath. We're going to start here. So start here and then do algebra. And then we're going to go arrive here. Now I don't know epsilon. Epsilon is just some positive quantity. The reason you need epsilon and delta to be positive is because these, in, these intervals wouldn't make any sense if delta was negative. You want to put the small on the left, the big on the right. So that's why. And just looking at the absolute value, would this absolute value make any sense if delta was negative? There would be no x values that would make absolute value negative. So that's the reason those are positive. And I'm just going to fill in 2x for f, l is 6. So what is our goal? I'll write that down in blue. So here's our goal. And x minus a, a is 3. So let's figure out how in the world do we get x minus 3 out of here using algebra. How in the world can we take 2x minus 6, turn it into x minus 3? It's not difficult algebra. Divide by 2, or factor out of 2, multiply by a half. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to multiply by a half. So is multiplying by half going to flip any inequalities? No, you have to be a little careful if you're going to do things like reciprocate both sides or uh, multiply by negatives. Never multiply by anything with x because you don't know if x is positive or negative necessarily. So if you multiply by an expression with x, that's very dangerous. But multiplying by half, no problem. 
The other option is I could factor a 2 out here. And then bring it outside. And then multiply by half. Well, look at that. We are exactly at x minus a. So that's where we want it to go. And what we have on the other side is delta. So we just figured out what delta needs to be. So when this is x minus a, the other side, this is delta. So when you have x minus a, what you have on the other side will be delta, assuming you did your algebra correct. So we just say let delta equal epsilon over 2. So whatever epsilon you're thinking of, as long as it's positive, I'm just going to take half of that number, and that'll be my delta. And hopefully that matches up with the graph that we drew up here, somewhere. Oh, oh, we picked. So up here I picked an epsilon so I could actually draw it. So I picked epsilon. If I wrote delta in terms of epsilon, uh, epsilon was 1 half times a half or one half epsilon. So it was my original epsilon just divided by two. So I picked an epsilon somewhere right here. So I chose so when you choose an epsilon you're not showing for every epsilon. You're saying hey for this exact one this is a delta that works. But that's not the same as saying pick any epsilon you want. So what we did is we generalized this idea and picked any epsilon and showed that delta is half that, whatever that epsilon you chose. And because all these algebra steps right here are equivalent, we didn't do any um, estimations, all these are equivalent, that if you satisfy any of these inequalities, you satisfy all of them. We didn't do any weird algebra here, make any estimations. So <coughs> they're all equivalent inequalities. So if one of them is true, they're all true. All right, so that, there's our delta, and that's all we had to do. So let's do one more of these. I never solved for x. Well, not by itself, but like don't have any numbers in front. So, so I got rid of the coefficient algebraically. Is that like Basically, yeah. Okay. Or I like to think about it, you're, you're not really solving for x, you're solving for x minus a. So like that's what I mean, arrive here. Like that's your goal right there. So yeah, I, I wouldn't think about it as getting x by itself. Oh, yeah. I mean, uh, it's solving for x minus a is what you're doing. So let's let g of x equal so we'll do one fourth x minus two. Let's find limb x approaches negative 8, g of x. All right, so take uh, some time right now, find this limit. 
should be easy to do, no divide by zero or any other weird stuff going on. All right, what is our limit? So we got negative two minus two, negative four. Is that right? Plug in negative eight. Is that right? That seems right. All right, so our limit's negative four, and that's our L value. So we can write down what all these letters are. So L is negative four, what is A? Negative eight, and if you need to write it, G of X is, oh, that's already written down, so it's a little bit of a waste to write that. We got G of X written up top there. And I should probably write G. So we're going to do some algebra and get down to x minus a less than delta. And of course, a is 8. So this is actually x minus a negative 8, also known as x plus 8. So can you solve for x plus 8? And g of x was 1 fourth x minus 2 minus negative 4. So it should be pretty clear to add the constants together. And what do we do to get rid of that 1 fourth? Multiply by 4. Positive 4, not negative 4. So go ahead and do those steps. Really just two or three algebra steps. And I connect these together. And you can't think of it as getting rid of the coefficient in front of x if you want to, but it's really solving for x, in this case x plus 8. You should have gotten four epsilon as your delta. So any questions on those algebra steps? So all those inequalities are equivalent right there. All we really did was multiply by four and just simplify. <laughs> there wasn't really very much going on in these inequalities. So if one of them's true, all of them will be true. So it's a little strange. Our delta was four times bigger than epsilon. Why is that? Well, what was our slope of our original function? One fourth. So that's not very steep. So if we think about what is one fourth, let's think about going um, over four 
open up one right here. I'll draw another part of that line. So if we think of taking a vertical amount right here, when we look at the horizontal amount that turns into, it would be four times bigger. So whatever your original interval was, because your function is relatively flat, your horizontal amount you could change is pretty large. So that's why we got that four times bigger. Yep. So if the slope was epsilon over four, then it would, um, no, I mean, wait, the slope was four x, would the um, delta be epsilon over four? Yes. Okay. So for a linear function, it's basically the reciprocal of the slope. Uh, well, I should say the reciprocal of the absolute value of the slope. Because if this was a negative one-fourth slope, the intervals would be the same size. So if it was tilted this way, the line, it would have the same intervals right there. So this is relatively easy to do with a line. What if you don't have the same slope everywhere? i.e. you're not aligned. So that gets a little more complicated. And a relatively easy function is a square root. So we'll look at, I think square root and the square function are probably the two easiest functions that aren't linear to go to. So we'll just go square root. We'll go with f of x equal, we'll just do square root x. Not do any shifts or transformations, keep it easy. So let's look around 1. I think that would be a good x value to use. I could go for 4 just as well, but let's just go for 1. So this is square root function is x to the half power. What do our limit laws tell us for x to the one half power? I know that was last section, it was a long time ago. So I can just plug in the value as long as what happens. As long as you're, in this case, a to the n power, or your base to the uh, whatever power is real, you're allowed to do this. So as long as you're not complex, or divided by zero, you're allowed to just plug in the value. So as long as you get a number out of it, you can just plug the number in. All right, now we're going to prove that this limit actually is 1. It's a little weird because a and l are the same number, so that would be a little strange, but not too big of a deal. A equals 1, L equals 1, we have our f of x written down. So proof, same first line, any epsilon greater than 0. Same exact starting point, fx minus L less than epsilon. So those don't change whatsoever.
and our goal is to get down to x minus a less than delta, which is x minus 1. Oh man, how in the world do we solve for x minus 1 when we start out with square root x minus 1? I could square both sides, and if I do that, I get epsilon squared, which is, that's not a problem at all. Better or worse? I'm going to go with worse. Although, there's, there is an x, but the reason it's definitely worse is that middle term's really bad. What can I multiply by that doesn't give me a middle term? Conjugate? Oh, there we go. Conjugate. That'll square out basically both terms. So let's multiply by square root x plus 1. Now, to be fair, you can't just do that on the left side. You have to do it on the right side. And technically, we multiplied by the absolute value. Because I push it inside the absolute value, we multiply by the absolute value of square root x plus 1. Can square root x plus 1 be negative? Nope. Square root is going to be positive or 0 at the smallest. Plus 1 won't be negative. So I won't actually need to keep the absolute value signs on the right side. It's a slight problem to have an x on the right side, and we'll deal with that. But let's just go with the left side, because that's the entire reason we did this. So now we have square root x squared minus 1 squared. So I just multiplied conjugates, a minus b times a plus b. I'll write that down for the, I don't know how many of the time, a squared minus b squared. All right, so that is the operation we did. All right, so we're almost there. Wouldn't it be nice to just say, uh, let delta equal that right there? The only problem is, if you pick, uh, if, if we take some epsilon, we can't just say, oh, well, that depends on what x you pick nearby. So what we're going to do is we're going to pick the worst x close by. So <coughs> depending on what x we choose, different x's will give us different deltas. So what we're going to do is basically pick the worst x that we possibly can to give us the um, smallest delta. So what I want to do is basically pick the worst x to get the smallest delta. smallest positive delta. You do not want a delta e to equal 0. Delta equals 0, there's no room in that interval to pick an x out of. So we definitely cannot have delta equal 0. So we'll go back up to our graph. I'm going to erase the 4 and the 9. They're not really relevant over here. We're allowed to say delta is less than some positive value. So I could just arbitrarily say, well, for example, delta should not equal 2. Why would 2 be a really bad number for delta? Yeah, go 2 to the left, and you got problems. So already, delta can't be bigger than 1, for sure. Because if I let delta equal 2, I got, I'm going to 
plug-in values over here. So already, delta should be no bigger than 1, definitely. So I'm going to write that down. Uh, no matter what, what delta can't be bigger than 1. So for sure, we're going to be either this interval or smaller. So from this interval, let's think about what is the worst x that I could pick to make my delta the smallest. So we, we're going from 0 to 2. What is the worst x you could pick over here to make delta the smallest? So is 0 the worst, or is 2 the worst? It looks like 0 will be the w worst. 0 will give me the smallest delta. 2 gives me a bigger delta. So 1, if I let x equal 1, I would get 2 epsilon. If x is 0, I would just get epsilon. And if x is 2, I would get something a little bigger than 2 epsilon. I get square root 2 plus 1 epsilon. So I'm going to pick x equals 0, and that gives the delta equals epsilon, delta equals epsilon here. So the only thing we now have to worry about, what happens if epsilon is bigger than 1? You just go with delta as 1. So we're going to combine these two together. And we're going to use the minimum function, the minimum of epsilon and 1. So it's going to take the minimum of those two values, whatever is smaller. So if your epsilon is 25, that's way too big. I'm just going to go with 1 as my delta. Remember, it's supposed to work for any epsilon greater than 0. So if we scroll back up to our graph, if you pick a crazy big epsilon, let's say your epsilon is 25. I can't really fit 25, but I'll represent it by that. I think we all agree that if we take our delta to be 1, anything inside this interval certainly lands, uh, the f of x will land inside that big vertical interval right there. Yeah, I'm never going to hit anything down here. But definitely, if you take any x value in here, you're going to actually land very specifically between those two marks. So you'll definitely be in that big vertical interval there. I apologize for all the flashing, but they updated OneNote to this new flashy version. These right here, these proofs are more difficult if you don't have a line, because you have to be very careful about your, uh, your delta. And a lot of times you're picking uh, something using an estimation. So I just say it couldn't be more than one, and also uh, in this case, had to be no more than epsilon as well. And actually, we'll do one-sided limit definition when we do one-sided limits in that section. So these questions are a little hard to ask on web work. So there are some questions on web work that I have for the definition, but I recommend do some book problems to get ready for your quiz. So also do some book problems.
So we finish this today. I will go and open your homeworks. And that means we could do a quiz as early as Wednesday on definition. So either Wednesday or Thursday for definition of a limit quiz. We'll have a quiz on Tuesday or What's the previous chapter because you finished it on Friday. Yeah, but we could have a quiz Tuesday, but I'm telling you there's going to be a quiz on this section. Okay. Not only this section, but you also need to know everything from before as well. So I didn't do trig would be difficult on this because you'd have to the trig functions are not linear. They're very not linear, so you'd have to be very careful about just like we did just now. So all right, we're going on to one side of limits now. So we'll write down our, not the actual definition right now, but what this means. So I'm just using the right arrow for approaches, or gets close to. Another thing we could write down is x is not a. So it's close to a, but not equal to a. And we'll start out with the left limit. So if we represent this visually, x approaches a means x is going to get closer to a. So if that's a, x is moving closer on both sides. So one side limit, you just have one side. So we'll start with the left limit, and we will have something really similar. Except in our left limit, here's a, we want to approach specifically on the left side. So we're going to have x approaching a. So if we set up an inequality, definitely that means x is not equal to a, but specifically x is less than a. And if you keep your inequalities ordered small to big, you can write them just below a number line, and it works out just, uh, just as well. So I see the little x is on the left, so x less than a. Now we're going to write that out in a limit. Lim. So it would be way too much work to write the word, so don't write this down. Mathematicians are way too lazy to write the word left right there. That would be a very reasonable thing to do. What we're going to do instead is we write a plus in the exponent of a. That little plus sign right there means, whoa, that should be a minus sign. Jeez. That minus sign means approach A from the left. So it might seem difficult to remember. Well, negative means from the left. So what symbol do you think we're going to use for right? A plus, very good. So how in the world do we keep these two separated? So what I like to think about this one from negative land. From negative land, well I should point this way. My right is your left. So from negative land, we're approaching. So where the bad kids go, can't go to Disneyland. They go to negative land. All right. So that's a good way to remember the negative. I want to call it a negative exponent, but that's not really what it is. It's a superscripted minus sign.
All right, so that meets from the left. And specifically, that means x is less than a. So the other limits was x was not equal to a. This one is x is less than a. And now we'll do right limit. Actually, before we do that, let's write the, a really quick definition here. Now, it might seem silly to keep writing out the definition multiple times, but every time you write out a definition or anything, theoretically, you remember it a little bit better. So we'll write it out one more time. Any epsilon greater than 0 there exists. Actually, now we've written it a few times. Let's get extra mathematically lazy. So that upside down a means all. So what is there exists? Of course, we have a symbol for that. You can't flip an e upside down but you can turn it backwards. So we flip letters around to make words or phrases. All epsilon, there exists a delta such that st, s period, t period. Don't write down the if and the then. We'll shortcut those also. So if then, what I said in class talking about theories, you can use a double right arrow. So that stands in for if what's before it, then what comes after it. So that's the shortest way you can possibly write out the definition right there. And so this double arrow means implies. So A implies B means if A, then B. So that is the least amount of writing we can do to fully write out the definition of limit. Is this the left limit definition or regular limit definition? This is a regular one. So how do we change it around to make it a left limit? The only difference is x is less than a. Can't be more than a. Yep. Oh, because we're, we're going to modify this a little bit. I'm just writing the uh, original definition of a limit, and then we're going to modify it a tiny bit to account for the left side. So left limit, what that really is a restriction on x's. So we need to focus on this inequality. So I want to make sure x is close to a, but only specifically on the left side. So I want x to be in only the left half of this interval, not the right half. So I need to get rid of all that stuff right there. So number lines are great for intuition. It should be pretty clear that that inequality needs to be true because I got small, medium, large, left, middle, right lined up. All right, and from here, let's, hmm, what are we going to do? I want to solve for, let's subtract A from every, from all three sides. Now, does subtraction flip your inequalities? Only thing that flips them is multiplication, division by negatives, and reciprocals. 
There's probably some other operation I'm not thinking of, but addition subtraction never changes your inequality. So subtraction A from all three, we have a negative delta less than x minus A less than A minus A, which is zero. All right, we're almost there. How in the world do I get something like x minus a less than delta? I'm going to do something dangerous, which is multiply by a negative 1. So we have regular delta, negative x minus a, and 0. What happens to our inequalities? They all flip right here. Now let's write it in order. And we could distribute the negative. Or write it as a minus x. So this inequality is what's going to replace the original inequality right here. So I'm going to erase the original one and rewrite that bottom one in its place. Oh, there's no absolute value. That's not right. There we go. All right, so why in the world is A minus X? Because X is smaller than A. So if it's X minus A, you'll get negative if it's the other order. And that is not going to be greater than 0. So there's our left limit definition.